So let's get started. Okay. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to do the, we're going to wrap up kind of like the NIOS 2 interface, right? So we are in week four. So basically today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use the SD RAM, okay? Uh, because if you are if you have any practical code size, especially on the DE1 where on-chip memory is limited, you want to use the SD RAM. But you should also know how to like use external peripherals. So that's point number one. Point number two is a lot of you are getting done with lab two, which is good. So your lab three is actually a lead into the project. So you want to write a C program that displays a count of seconds of the seconds the program has been running on the seven segment displays, okay? There are basically two ways to do this. One way is to actually use, remember we instantiated a timer core? That's the point of, for example, the timer core, you, timer core, you can use uh, the, that core to count the number of seconds the program has been running, okay? Or you can write your own external module, right? And interface it to the DE, to the NIOS, but that's difficult because the question says you have to display a count of seconds that the program has been running. So once the program starts, it has to tell your external core to start counting. So it's doable, but this is where you have to make a decision between if you want to do it solely in software or you want to do it in both, you want to do hardware software co-design, okay? In the sense you have a hardware peripheral that's actually communicating to your software. And in this case, it's much better if you just do everything in software. It's just a lot easier, right? So that's lab three. However, although lab three is due only in week seven, let's say best case scenario, you finish lab three by the start of week seven, you have only one, two, three, like four weeks to do the project, okay? There is no final exam in this course. Your project presentations are going to be in week 11, right? depending on everybody's final schedules. But I recommend you start on the, like I told you in lab yesterday, start on the project as soon as you can, ideally by the end of this week, right? Some of you already know what you want to do. If that's not what you want to do, figure out what you want to do and start by, ideally, like I said, by the end of this week or by next week. Because you already know how to start using the NIOS. So just start on it, okay? All right, that's point number one. Point number two is since my website's back up and running, on the server for weeks four and five again, you have all these NIOS tutorials. I'm gonna go through NIOS demo because I downloaded the zip file and I unzipped it. Okay, so here it is. I don't remember if this thing has SDRAM. So let's just take a look at it. Okay, so I'll open up the Quartus project. And basically again, uh, the you should keep your project org folder pretty clean. There should be no spaces in the folder name. And in in my case, let's see. It's basically giving me a message that uh, I created this in version 11 point whatever, and we're using 13.0, but it's backwards compatible. So you can say, find them. You can overwrite the 11.0 project settings with 13.0, no problems. And what I was gonna say was, although I've saved my uh, folder on the desktop, notice that there are no spaces in the folder names, right? Something very simple, which people forget. Okay, so, Let's look at what else is, what are the folders are there? So here's the main project folder. There is a workspace for each Eclipse project. I just keep it separate, right? Because in essence, you're really not going to share modules between different projects in academia, all right? In industry, in industry you might, and your company will have its own protocol on how to do it. No, not in industry, you might. In, in industry, you definitely will. But anyway, I keep my own workspace for each uh, separate, each project. Then let's see, software is where you have the board support package, okay? And the code itself. So there it is. So I guess I have both those files, so I don't need them. Anyway, let's go in here, look at the top level. So you can see, basically at the top level, I have my uh, component declaration for the NIOS 2, all right? Which I got from my QSIS. So I just make the component and I just instantiate it. That's it, okay? So uh, let's get into QSIS and look at how to instantiate the SDRAM, okay? 
so let's see it's not in here but if you go and so while QSIS is okay it's got a load see while it's loading there let me search for the Altera University program uh, let's see so like I said the first thing you want to do is you want to so if you go into embedded systems okay if you go to IP course the first thing you want to do is install this university program installer like I said it'll give you a bunch of extra cores for connecting for example to the PS2 device uh, to your VGA okay so that's what you want to do and of course choose the right version of Cordis ours is 13.0 okay and what I'm going to do is let's see there should be if you my resolution is poor there, there should be a separate option for VHDL but whatever so what we're going to do is so this is the these are the IP cores what I want is the SD RAM and the SD RAM is not in here because it's a general document it's not part of the university program IP core in the sense Again, once you install the come on. once you install the university pro program, you'll see an extra library here. But that's not where the SD RAM is. So there are some warnings, and the, what it's telling you is I created this again in an older version of QSIS. So it's just asking you to upgrade. Uh, have newer cores, have newer versions available. So it's all been upgraded. So just, just say okay, all right? Now going back, so to get the SDRAM documentation, you go to tutorials, okay? So then choose, of course, VHDL, choose the right board, and then here, okay? And it's got other documentation as well. I don't have time to go through this. You can do software debugging, all right? Uh, HAL is, like we discussed, is called the hardware abstraction layer. So that's a set of device drivers which is provided for you in C device drivers, if you will, that is provided for interfacing with your different course. So the university program provides its own set of HAL drivers, for example, to interface for interfacing with VGA. Okay. Now, once you install the university program, I'll definitely show this to you on Monday. But if you go into your Altera folder, okay, you will see something called university program here. So if you go under there, again, I'll show this to you on Monday, you'll see a lot of examples, okay? So look through them. Uh, do not focus only on the examples for the DE1. Look at examples for different boards, right? The whole point is at the software level, it's all very similar. Only at the hardware level, it's very specific. So the software examples should be compatible across different boards. Is that clear? So again, you got to read a lot. But basically, I'm going to follow this document the only difference is this document shows you, well, once it load, I don't think I can actually connect to it because it's going through FTP and MSOEs, whatever, routers might block it. But anyway, in this SDRAM document, they show you how do you configure the SDRAM completely within QSIS. Yeah, it's not going to let us go. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use an external PLL to configure the clock for the SDRAM, okay? Again, the, uh, the reason why I'm doing it differently is to show you another method of doing it, right? The, uh, once you install the university program library in QSIS, there is a, basically, if you can use that core inside the university program to instantiate a PLL, right? You can do that within QSIS. You can do that in Quartus. I'm gonna show you how to use the mega wizard. And this document actually mentions that. It tells you, oh yeah, you can do that using the mega wizard. Okay. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to add the SDRAM core. So let's go in here. Sorry, the SDRAM controller. So it's under memories and memory controllers. There, memories, external memory interface. Where is SDRAM interfaces? Okay. Now. We're going to instantiate, a, I mean, we're going to add a generic SDRAM controller, okay? Mm -hmm. And we're going to configure this, all right? 
So the configuration information is actually in this document. And I can't, I forgot I can't access it. Let me see, uh, let's see, using the SD RAM. Let's see if I can get it on the web, on Altera's D1 boards. Or, so yeah, it's on the FTP. User manuals. Nope. Yeah, I don't think it'll let me go to that. So what I'm going to do is basically I'm going to try using my cell phone because it's not on the Wi-Fi network. But in the meantime, you can get this information from where else can you get this information from? Can you tell me? So let's say uh, whatever the board manufacturer, let's say you go to a company and they don't have this nice document which tells you how to do it. Where can you get this information from? Yeah, the data sheet. That's where you get it from, right? And it's actually, if you look at the SDRAM chip on your board, Google search for the data sheet, I've done it, all right? And just read through it. In the first two pages, you'll find this information, right? It's there. So let's see, uh, DE1. So let me pause this lecture. Interesting. All right, so we're back. So using my cell phone, I got on, I got the document, right? So that has information. Okay. So here it is. All right, so the bits is 16. The number of chip selects is one. You have four banks. You have 12 rows, eight columns. And your memory says eight megabytes, yes? So let's look on the DE1. Let's just be sure. Yes, it's eight megabytes. But that doesn't mean anything in the sense you have to confirm this with the data sheet, ideally, okay? Of course, let's say your uh, board has one of these chips on it. Just use that configuration. So it just depends on what SDRAM chip is on your board. On our boards, we don't have any of these chips, okay? Now let's look at timing. I think in, for this, the timing parameters, uh, you can leave it as default. We will not simulate. Yeah, that's it. This should be default, okay? So hit finish. That's it. So at SDRAM, this is a controller, okay, which, is, which basically communicates with your external SDRAM chip. So what we're going to do is first I'm going to rename this as SDRAM controller. I'm going to just move it up, right? Oh, by the way, if it's getting too cluttered, you can like um, condense any of the cores, right? expand this there all right okay so let's see where's my SDRAM controller it's up here so let me do this let me move the CPU up all right so the SDRAM controller needs a clock okay. and it needs a reset yes okay so now what you should do before you use any kind of external memory, is you should run something called as a mem test. So how many of you have heard of the word mem test? So it's a standard uh, memory, like for example, there's actually a tool for the 8086, which actually does it. But basically what you have to do is you have to write C code, which runs on your on-chip memory first. And what it does is it writes to the first address in SDRAM, some data, reads it back, okay? So if the, if the readback data is equal to the data you wrote, that probably means your SDRAM is working fine. Right? Again, memtest is a pretty complicated thing. And I'm not expecting you to run the full memtest. Right? But what I would like you to do is, as a first pass to understanding how this works, do not connect the instruction master to SDRAM. Okay? Leave it with on-chip memory. So the instructions execute from on-chip memory. But just you connect the data master 
okay and then run a mem test from your c code is that clear so when you do connect uh the instruction master what you have to do is you have to go inside the cpu come on Let's see details I can't get inside the CPU. No, nope, not letting go. Since I don't have a mouse, this makes it very difficult. So anyway, what you have to do is you have to go inside the CPU and make your reset vector and exception vector point to the SDRAM controller. Okay, that's only after you run a mem test. However, the mem test will take you like 24 hours. It takes a long time, right? So what I recommend you do is you run it for like a couple of hours, right? Let it keep running. Come back and see if there are any errors. There shouldn't be. If you screw this up, right, any of these timing, you will get an error in like the first pass. Like the moment you write the first, write some data to the first address and read it back, you're going to start getting errors. But in industry, that's what you will be expected to do. Whenever you have external memory, let's say you spin out your own board, put a memory chip on it, your boss, he or she will ask, hey, run a, they'll say, hey, run a mem test, right? Just to make sure you didn't screw anything up. Okay? So uh, not recommended to connect the instruction master first. Right? Use on chip memory, run that mem test. Then once it works, come back in, disconnect the instruction master from on chip memory and connect it to SDRAM. All right? So any questions so far? Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna export what is called as the conduit. All right? The conduit is what lets us connect the ports at the top level which actually go to your physical SDRAM with this controller inside the NIOS 2 subsystem. Is that clear? So I just press enter, okay, and it's called SDRAM controller wire. And if you go under HDL example, so there it is, okay, the conduit has been exported, but this is in Verilog, right? So just switch to HDL, and there it is, okay? Notice though that you don't have SDRAM clock. Because what we are going to do is, like I said, I didn't use the university program core and put the PLL. I didn't instantiate the PLL inside the NIOS subsystem. Okay, I'm going to use the, I'm going to instantiate the PLL in Cordis at the top level using the Mega Wizard. Okay. All right. So right now you still have two errors, and you can easily fix the memory overlaps by auto assigning base addresses, and all gone. Right. So let's save this. I'm actually not going to upload this project back on the digital systems website. What I recommend you do is you download the uh, NIOS2 demo like I downloaded and go through this by yourself, right? So you have an idea of how to do this. And use that, um, use this document. Oh, let's see. This one, okay? Again, it will be slightly different from what I'm doing in the sense they will instantiate the PLL within the... NIOS2 subsystem you know, using the university program installer. So before you do this, what you have to do is you have to, well, it's not in here. You have to go under IP course, it's not under tutorials. You have to install this, okay? And of course, make sure that Cordis and QSIS are all closed because it's going to add the library. And obvious things. Okay, so I'm not gonna let it generate. I mean, you can just generate it, right? Oh, by the way, if you notice in the generation, I have simulation models, okay, in model sim for you. Now, this takes a long time, right, to generate simulation models. Uh, let's say you're, you're not doing a simulation project. I recommend you turn these off, okay? Okay? Create HDL files for synthesis, VHDL. This is synthesis. Okay, this you need, but don't create simulation models or test benches. It just takes a really long time. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let me show you how to instantiate the clock in QSIS. Okay, the only uh, thing about the SDRAM clock is the SDRAM clock should have a three nanoseconds phase lead as compared 
to your system clock. Okay, and this you, information you can also get from the data sheet. It's also there in that little uh, document. Okay. Again, usually you don't have a nice tutorial like this in industry. Okay. So your Bible is the data sheet. Now this is this actually having this making this three nanoseconds um, phase lead is what makes designing an SDRAM controller difficult. If you think about using a finite state machine to specify this, it's actually tough. It's doable. It's not impossible. Right? And not only that, there's a lot of uh, timing intensive stuff which goes into designing a controller for SDRAM. So at Berkeley, for example, this is like a three week, uh, two week actually, lab check project checkpoint. Okay? It's not that easy. In the case of using a soft processor, you can just put a little core like we did, just select some um, options and boom, you're done, okay? Very easy. So that's why uh, this whole soft processor thing is becoming very popular. Right? Now, if you wanna learn how to design FSMs which are timing critical, this is, an SDNAM controller is the standard, okay? But it's not the point of this course. So, anyway, so let's go into tools, Mega Wizard Plugin Manager, so create a new custom mega function variation. I'm gonna go into IO, uh, make alt PLL. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make um, NIOS SDRAM PLL in the sense, underscore. Yeah. I'm gonna have two clocks, okay? So one is the 50 megahertz clock going to the NIOS. The other one is going to be delayed, okay? I forgot if it's three or 30 nanoseconds. Let me look it up now I think about it. The other is going to be delayed appropriately to res with respect to the first clock. Is that clear? Let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Can also be done three nanoseconds. I was right, right? So it's dnmpll.vhd. So hit next. Fire up. Okay, in general, what speed grade seven is the speed grade? Oh, the speed grade you get from, if you go into hierarchy, see the seven at the end, that's the speed grade. If you want to know, all right. What is the frequency of the input clock? It's not 100, it's 50, okay? That's a fine. And the reason why I want to have two clocks is, see the board clock is kind of always running, right? So uh, making a three nanosecond delay with respect to the board clock, timing wise doesn't make any, doesn't make sense. So now I have two clocks which start at the same time. The second clock is gonna be delayed with respect to the first clock. So it's a more uh, sound design, right? So let's see. Next, um, I'm not, I don't have to create a locked output. Uh, create an in clock, uh, use this clock. So C0, 50 megahertz, right? By the way, if you wanted to know how fast you can run your NIOS cores, you can even Google search that, right? So if you look at NIOS 2 uh, Maxim, I forgot how I found this. Clock speed. Altera has a document. Yeah, performance benchmarks. This I can't open because it's not on FTP. So again, F is the fast processor, S is standard, E is economy. I always use fast, right? It really doesn't take up that much room for the functionality it provides. So there are, uh, oops. So here it is, right? Depends on what FPGA you're using. What do we have, the Cyclone 2, yes? Again, this is C6 speed grade, all right? You might be able to run a little faster, but you can run 140, 110. Economy can go up to 195 megahertz. More than enough, right? For any embedded applications. So next, uh, yes, use this clock. Okay, this is important. So the output frequency of this clock is going to be actually 50 megahertz. The class, ah, the clock phase shift is going to be minus three nanoseconds. It's gotta be a lead, all right? And if you specify this incorrectly, when you do the mem test, it'll fail. So mem test is very important, okay? 
So general uh, tip. Again, it'll take you more than 24 hours to test, I think, the entire memory. Right? Memtest is really slow. But the memtest which we do, simply writing something to the first address, reading it back, and comparing it. Whereas this one, the one I showed you, the memtest 86, that's like configured to run really fast. Right? I think it's primarily written in like assembly. I don't remember. I played around with it like 12 years ago, the actual memtest. All right, so next, that's about it actually, right? This is, that's all you need to do to take care of the clocks. Next, finish, okay? Okay. So let me just instantiate this. Go up here. Save that. I don't need that anymore. Component on this. And component. Okay, let me just generate this code. In the sense I need to, let's see, HDL example. Copy this and generate. So it should start generating. Let it do its thing. So here, what I'm going to do, so I'm going to replace this old component, yes, a new one, and this instantiation. I'm going to take it down here. Actually, let me do this. Let me copy this down here. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do my work on my clocks. So let me call this signal on clock 50 megahertz, NIOS clock 50 megahertz, face lead, SD RAM, okay, is of type standard logic, yes. And there is, uh, the SD RAM reset is actually active high. So let's use a reset there. Ah! Reset is not of key zero. Yes. Uh, then first, let me instantiate the PLL. Let me call this U zero. Mm -mm, port map. Okay. So a reset becomes reset. In clock is our board clock. C1 and C0 is what is it? Clock 50 megahertz NIOS. What do I called it? Say clock 50 megahertz NIOS. This lead is DRAM. Okay. So C1 is clock 50 megahertz. Phase lead as DRAM. Okay. Done with that. I know VHDL is not case sensitive, but in case of keywords. All right, so that's that. Let's see how our generator is going. Uh oh, errors. Let's see what happened here. 64 errors. Oh, uh, the problem is okay, so this is what you will also get if you try to use this project. The path is incorrect, right? So when I generated this, I did this on a different drive, like when I specified all the cores. So what you have to do, unfortunately, well, if somebody figures out how to fix this, um, you, you may have to re-instantiate all the components, okay? I know, so, oh, okay, okay, never mind. So I just saw it. So the path is incorrect, never mind, thank you. So, so let's go back and Display high. No, 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 I don't want that. Uh, now I'll sub to subsystem select. Okay. Uh, let's see, now I'll do subsystem. Syn no, no. Let's see, this is the path. Yeah, here it is. Okay? Sorry, so choose the right path. Because my path was saved for my computer. So let's try this again. Generate, all right, it's generating. Let's go back here. So it's generating. Let's do this. Okay, so let's see, clock now is clock 
clock 50 megahertz NIOS okay reset N <coughs> connect that to key 0 like we're doing up in the old one right this one connect to is LED PIO I think it is yep connect to LED underscore PIO, right? So all, now all of this is the old stuff. Now you know why you need to have pretty a high resolution like projector. This just sucks. All right, so this is all done. So let me delete the old component instance. And I've already used U0. So we call this U1, okay? Now what we have to do is we have to connect all the SDRAM stuff. So uh, the information for doing this is again in this document, right? So it's in here, but it's also obvious how to do this in the sense if you go to your DE1 users manual, it'll show you what all the pin assignments are, or you can go into the pin planner and let's see, oops. So if you scroll down, I think it's called DRAM. There it is, okay? So here is all the information. So DQ is the data, right? Uh, so this is low data, upper data, write enable, active low. So these are all DRAM interface signals. The whole point is it's abstracted away in the sense if you look at here, the way this is labeled, it's kind of obvious what to connect to what, right? So let's do that in the sense. Um, so we're declare all these ports now. Mm, semicolon, yeah. Well, I'm gonna, since I don't have high enough resolution, I'm just gonna use what's on my cell phone. I'll just type it in, right? So DRAM clock, uh, DRAM, Clock enable is out standard logic. Uh, DRAM address is out standard logic vector 11 down to 0, right? Uh, let's see. DRAM, was it 12 bits? Yeah, it was 12 bits. Okay. DRAM. Bank address zero, DRAM. Now, when I, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking, right? This is of type. Uh, buffer, standard logic. If I, as I'm doing this, um, when I look at my bank address here, this is of type standard logic vector, yes? But here I have standard logic. So how do I interface these signals to the DRAM, to the NIOS2 instance? How do I do it? You understand the question? Actually, this is of type out, yes? So I don't know why in that, um, make it out as well. So I don't know why he's, we can use buffer, but let me just use out. All right, so how do I do that? So Connor's idea was to concatenate them, but if I declare it as output port, can I do that? So if you can, if you declare it as buffer, then you can, you can try it. But I would like, I'm just gonna keep it as out, right? Because I don't really like the buffer data type, but whatever. So now how do I, given that this is out, how do I, what is another way I can connect? Yeah, so it's not two signals, like create another signal called uh, DRAM bank address, okay? Standard logic vector, one down to zero, yes? Connect this to this port, and then how do I tap out these two ports from this signal. 
How do I do that? So in this bank address, I'm going to do the thing I call DRAM bank address, yes? So how do I connect DRAM bank 0 and DRAM bank 1 to this? Yeah, what are the bits? So let's say I do this. How do I do that? Zero, yeah, that's it. Okay. So you may have to do this depending on like what your core is, but there it is. Okay. So now after this, it's I mean I'm gonna this lecture is I'm gonna stop ten minutes early because after this it's oh there is your DRAM clock. So there's your DRAM clock, yes. So as you notice, there is no DRAM clock here. That's because it's gonna come from your PLL because we don't have that university program core with us. So I'll just do that. Oops, because I copied it. Apparently I didn't. Okay. And I forgot to see. That's okay. DRAM underscore clock. There you go. That ought to do it. All right. Okay. And then you connect all this correspondingly. Synthesize. You will get the hardware ready. Okay. Now, as far as the software is concerned, how do you write to memory? So let me ask you that, and that's where we'll end the lecture. Let's see how it generates going. Oh, yeah, it's done. Right. Got a lot of warnings. I don't know what these warnings are. This is reset control. It's very annoying. Right? I don't know why I'm getting those warnings. But anyway, generate's done. <laughs> so in your C code, I'm just going to open it in Notepad++. How do I access this DRAM? So I told you, you have to write something to it, right? How do I do it? How do I write something to memory in C? No, it's not a function. OK, you have to know the address, like Connor said. There are two ways you can find the address. One way is you can go in here. That's the base address, OK? Or you can look in your system.h file once you regenerate your board support package. OK? Oh, where is it? So if you go to display high, BSP, you can look at this, or you can look at the summary. Right. So I'm going to edit it with Notepad. You can open this in Eclipse, but I'm just opening it in Notepad for speed. Let's see system configuration, LED PI on chip memory. There. There'll be something called SDRAM controller underscore base or something like that, right? Again, don't code in the raw address. That's the point of these preprocessor directives. Let's say this change changes, and it will change if you add other peripherals and say auto-generate base addresses. But this won't change un unless you change the name of the device, OK? That's the point of using all these preprocessor directives or variables or predefined constants. It's to make your code portable. But like Connor said, once you know the base address, how do you, what is the C concept, if you will, that you use to access memory? Pointers. So you just declare a pointer to this preprocessor directive and you write to it, you're going to write to the memory. It's very simple. Okay. Make sense? You can actually, if you actually go into Eclipse, right, I don't want to open it up because it's going to take too long. If you look, when you create a new Project, remember I chose blank project. If you actually look, there's actually a mem test there. So you can even look at that. Is that clear? All right, so that's about it for this lecture. So next week, what we're going to do is, like I said, we're going to sh I'm going to show you how to connect a custom core to your NIOS processor, OK? There are two ways to do this. One way is to actually connect, make it an Avalon device. That's, I think, chapter 14 of Choose Book. I don't, I don't remember. Right? But we're not going to do that because that takes a lot of effort and it requires a, you to be very good with like 2902 stuff. It, and it takes too long. Right? Rather, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use these PIOs. Okay? Basically, these PIOs here, programmable IOs, are simply wires. Okay? 
So you can just connect wires to your external core and do the communication like that. That's what I'm going to show you. That's also in Chu's book. It's chapter 13, right? I think it's chapter, one is, well, one is, cha it's chapter 13, 14, I think. Just look it up, right? Uh, but let's say for your project, you want to connect, you want to do a project where you learn, you want to learn how to connect a custom I.O. to uh, the Avalon bus, you can, right? And if you look at the end of, like, uh, let's say you don't have an idea of what project to do. Like I say in the syllabus, uh, if you look at, if you look in Chu's book, let's say you want to do the uh, custom I.O. peripheral using Avalon. If you look at chapter 14, the end of chap the chapter, he suggests some experiments. You can make that into your project. Okay? All right. So that's about it. I'll, uh, yeah, so I'll see you next week.